This 29% increase, just to put it into context, in 1990, J. Olshansky and his collaborators published a nice paper in Science. They asked, if nobody ever died of cancer, how much longer would people live? They found out that if the average American woman at that time would die at about 80 years of age. If she never, ever, ever got cancer after the age of 50, you're buying her 2.6 years. That is about a 3% extension. And if she never got a heart attack or a stroke, you're also buying her 2.7 years. So it's about 3%. So this drug combination is about 10 times better in terms of the proportion of extra life you get than a complete cure for cancer or a complete cure for heart attacks. It's wow. actually, if we could get even a half of that or a third of that benefit in people, which is of course a big if, but if that worked out in terms of the number of uh, healthy, active years of additional life you get, it's much better than a cure for cancer. I, I'm not against a cure for cancer, but I think the work we're doing has an awful lot more potential than a cure for cancer or a cure for heart attacks. I'm not just making that up and blowing smoke. It's um, based on our data. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Richard Miller. He is a professor of pathology at the University of Michigan and the director of the Michigan Glenn Center on Aging. He got his MD and PhD at Yale, did a postdoc at Harvard and Sloan Kettering, and was on the faculty at Boston University until his move to Michigan in 1990. I brought him on on the podcast to talk about aging and if there's any supplements or any kind of diet or lifestyle that can help reduce or slow down aging and also what his thoughts are on spermidine. I saw he spoke about that a bit and he had some interesting ideas there. And so I wanted to pick his brain about spermidine, but in general on aging. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming. And the, my first question, I, I think we could start with, in general, what's your opinion on, do you think that there's non-FDA approved, let's say, supplements out there right now that can help slow down aging? And, and I understand there's no clinical trials as you're well aware, because it's basically impossible to do a long-term clinical trial over 30, 40 years. And, you know, and seeing somebody's taking this and, you know, the control group is taking that. It's too expensive and nobody's funding it, these long-term trials. But I, I just wanted to get your overall opinion on the subject. I think that's a good way of setting up the question. My lab is, with a few others, devoted to the general idea that you can indeed find things that people, or in our case, mice, can take in their food, which will slow the aging process and postpone a very wide range of age-associated diseases and bad things that happen to you when you get old. One of the major things science has discovered in the last 20 years is that that's not just science fiction. There are things, drugs are the ones we've tested so far, that can extend greatly mouse lifespan, 20 to 30% in the best of instances. Supplements, for the purpose of this conversation, seem like things that might work, but the FDA is legally forbidden <laughs> to say much about them. Uh, and sure, I think in principle, uh, it's entirely possible that supplements, a legal definition, could also have good effects on health of mice and people. The next paper that I and my colleagues that are writing, these are the ITP, the Interventions Testing Program funded by NIA, the next ITP paper will have, in fact, our first two reports of over-the-counter supplements that you can buy at your local drugstore right now uh, that for mice extend lifespan. So far, they only extend lifespan in males, uh, male mice, and I'd like to find out why that is. And so far, the change is, you know, in the 10% area, we'd like to try other doses and maybe do better than that. But the question you asked was about, in principle, could it work? And the answer is, Yes, absolutely. And by the way, we have evidence, at least for mice, that it really does work. What do you think, like just if, you, if I were to ask you, what are the chances that if something works on mice, that it's going to work on humans? I, it's kind of like a broad science question, if you will. And it's hard to answer, but what, what, what's your general opinion on that? Well, the, the first thing to notice is that it doesn't have an answer because some, kind, some classes of drugs will be very specific for things that mice get or things that people get like Alzheimer's. Uh, and then there are other classes of drugs like those that 
depress or elevate mood or addict you that work just the same. So there's no general answer. The reason we're working in mice is not because um, we think that anything that works in mice will also work in humans. That's clearly wrong and would be a foolish thing. But if something works in mice, that means you really ought to pay attention to it if you want to work out something that will work in humans. It may be that it would work in humans. It might be that some other member of the family would work in humans. It might be that other drugs that have lower side effects, but target the same enzyme or the same cell type might work in humans. You know, the analogy that I often give when I'm giving a talk is that 30,000 years ago, people had stone tools. They could chop stuff. They could bash stuff. They could cut stuff. Right now, our, you know, the Swiss Army knife does a lot better. We, it's, we've had 30,000 years to refine those tools, to make them more precise, to get them to do what we want through clever ways. We're at the sort of stone tool stage of anti-aging drugs. But the fact is that you can make such drugs work, at least in mice, is a very strong hint that with enough effort and enough thought, uh, you could get something in that general nature to work in people and postpone most or all, if we're lucky, of the bad things that happen to you when you get old for 10% or 15% or 20%. A decade ago, well, two decades ago, that would have been a statement of hope. It would have been just uh, science fiction. But now we've got real data. That's great. And you mentioned, I, I really like that answer about it depends on what topic we're talking about, because you said mood is something that is going to have more relevance. And I'll take stuff that if it shows in mice that it's, it improves mood, almost always it improves my mood <laughs> when I take a high enough dosage and they're giving large dosages to these animals. So I think just my N equals one experiment kind of verifies that there is a, a high degree of correlation there. My statement is based right. upon the fact that if you're a pharmaceutical company and you screen a lot <laughs> of drugs to see if they help my sleep or something like that, you know darn well, not all of them are going to work in people, but if you might have 10 lead compounds and you really push it, maybe one of them will be a commercially successful and also pharmacologically helpful helpful compound for humans. I think it's likely that the same will happen in terms of anti-aging drugs. You mentioned the, that you did a study in male mice that, uh, that there was this compound that increased longevity. Are you able to tell what that compound is? Oh, yeah. It's going to be in our next paper. We have two. I mean, we've published now six agents that work in mice to extend lifespan to a significant degree. Two and of what the, are those agents? Oh, rapamycin. A carbose, okay. which is FDA approved for diabetes, 17 alpha estradiol, which is a form of estrogen, though it's not in human clinical practice, canagliflozin, which is also FDA approved for diabetes. Those are the ones that have the biggest effect. And then uh, protandum, which worked in males only and just a little bit. And what glycine. is protandum? Pardon? Protandum is what? That's one I have. It's a heard. mixture of five different botanicals that. Okay. Uh, each target the same general system. There's a, a molecule inside cells called NERF2, which helps make them resistant to stress. The people that said, please test our drug, Protandum, put it together because it influenced uh, the NERF2 system. And in our hands, it had a significant effect in males. It didn't affect maximum longevity. I thought it was an interesting discovery, and that, that would have to be included in our list of winners. But then the two things you asked about are the over-the-counter preparations, uh, they will be in our next paper with all the data for people who want to review it. One of those is meclizine, which is marketed because, among other things, it is good for seasickness and helps protect you against nausea that people get if they get seasick. The other is a product called astaxanthin, which is, whose mechanism of action is unknown, but uh, whose proponents think it does an awful lot of very good things, none of them proven in people. But the data we have are that both of those agents given to male mice at one concentration for each of them um, extended lifespan in the males to a significant effect. We don't quite know yet how they work, and we want to find out. You found that estradiol was a longevity agent. That the, the, the estradiol that you mentioned, is that the most active version of estradiol? No, it's an important – I'm glad you brought the question up. The estradiol that everybody knows about is 17-beta. Estradiol. That's oh, estrogen. Yeah. That's the stuff you get in estrogen creams and estrogen pills, okay. and it's the stuff that women have a lot of and men not so much. What we're working with is something related but importantly different. It's called 17 alpha estradiol. Chemically, it's just mm. one one bond position different. But uh, in practice, what that means is that the stuff we actually are using is about tenfold less potent at stimulating the regular old estrogen receptors 
the things that turn on secondary sexual characteristics, et cetera, et cetera, and also have a role to play in, uh, you know, breast cancer and that sort of stuff. Our stuff, 17 alpha estradiol, we don't know how it works. It could, for instance, be going to something in the brain and flipping a switch in the brain that's good for you, or it could be working through your uh, pancreatic beta cells, or it could be working through your vessels. We really would love to know how it works, but it works pretty well in the male mice. It's a, at the optimal dose. It's as good as rapamycin. Wow. And is that a natural estrogen found in the body or is that modified? Uh, there are some claims not really well supported that it's found in the brain. A couple of labs have found it in the brain. Of course, our stuff is chemically is made in a chemical mm. factory so okay. that it's pure and, uh, and unadulterated. And whether it's a natural product or not, it, it seems to have potent effects in male mice only. If you give it to females, it has no, um, no effects on their lifespan. A guy who used to be in my lab, Mike Garrett, who's now in New Zealand, asked, if you start with middle-aged mice, do you improve their, um, their grip strength, for instance, and their ability to uh, not fall down from a rotating rod and their ability to handle glucose uh, boluses? And very interesting, he found the answer was yes to those questions, but in males only. It had uh, benefits in the male mice only. Another person who used to be in my lab, a woman named Mariana Sadogursky, uh, looked at the brains of the mice that had gotten 17 alpha estradiol. And she looked at a part of the brain, the hypothalamus, that, that's important in controlling lots and lots of downstream things outside the brain. She found that inflammation went up with aging, as others had found previously. But interestingly, 17 alpha estradiol blocked that form of brain inflammation and did so only in male mice. Could it be that uh, the estrogens that women naturally have? are acting in a similar way that, you know, adding the benefit of this 17 alpha estradiol is not giving any benefit? That's a very good idea. That was what we thought was the case. It, and we don't know for sure. I now think it's kind of unlikely because we had originally thought, look, let's take the males, let's give them 17 alpha estradiol. Maybe they'll get to be as good as the females. And in fact, they went way beyond the females. So it oh. was it was not just mimicking the good stuff, estrogenic stuff that the females made on their own. It was a matter of pushing the males past where the females were. And it had no effect on females, either their lifespan or in Mike Garrett's hands, their grip strength or rotor rod function, etc. It had only a male specific effect. Just throwing out a theory that maybe the female estrogens are kind of blocking some receptor some kind of estrogen receptor or some kind of pathway that this 17 alpha estradiol would go down, but instead these other estrogens that it's kind of overwhelming, they, their, their system is already overwhelmed with the estrogen that it's not helping. Yeah, but I think that's perfectly reasonable. That's a perfectly good idea. The idea that we're pursuing is slightly different. We found, uh, this is again, Mike Garrett's work, that if you gave 17 alpha estradiol to male mice, they quickly turned it into a different steroid and the females uh. didn't do it. The males mm -hmm. made 20 times the normal level of these other steroids, which are called estriols. So the hypothesis we're testing now is that the good stuff is actually the estriols that only the males make. Uh, only the males and have an enzyme that will metabolize 17-alpha to the estriols. We don't know if it's going to work in, but if it works in both males and females, then we will have been right. And the estriols are obviously, that we know for sure is natural. It's one of the major yes. estrogen groups. Right. Yes, it is. Uh, okay, so out of all the drugs that you've tested or or compounds, sure, uh, which are do any of them perform better than rapamycin? You mentioned this uh, seventeen alpha is kind of like similar. Do any of them perform better than rapamycin? A paper just came out in which we broke our own personal group record, and it was from a combination of drugs: rapamycin plus a carbose. Rapamycin works great. Uh, in males, a carbose works great in males, but if you give them both together, you do better than either drug alone. We can actually increase the median survival of the males by 29%. That sets two records. It's the best we've ever done by giving anything to a mouse. And also, it's the first example we have of a situation in which two drugs do better than either drug did alone. In general, there's, there aren't many synergies within this longevity research that you're doing? So it's We don't like know. I, we're certainly hoping the answer is yes. There'll be tons of synergies or at least additive effects. Testing one drug costs money. Co testing two drugs mm -hmm. together costs the same amount of money. We need to have a clear rationale for why a two-drug combination may work better than either drug used alone. But there, there clearly are 
good ideas in that uh, area. And we're testing a couple more combinations in the mice born this year. We're going to test a couple more combinations in the mice that will be born next year. So I, the general notion of using two at a time has a lot to recommend it. This 29% increase, just to put it into context, in 1990, J. Olshansky and his collaborators published a nice paper in Science. They asked, if nobody ever died of cancer, how much longer would people live? They found out that if the average American woman at that time would die at about 80 years of age. If she never, ever, ever got cancer after the age of 50, you're buying her 2.6 years. That is about a 3% extension. And if she never got a heart attack or a stroke, you're also buying her 2.7 years. So it's about 3 so this drug combination is about 10 times better in terms of the proportion of extra life you get than a complete cure for cancer or a complete cure for heart attacks. It's wow. actually, if we could get even a half of that or a third of that benefit in people, which is of course a big if, but if that worked out in terms of the number of uh, healthy, active years of additional life you get, it's much better than a cure for cancer. I, I'm not against a cure for cancer, but I think the work we're doing has an awful lot more potential than a cure for cancer or a cure for heart attacks. I'm not just making that up and blowing smoke. It's um, based on our data. I, I think that's really great that you put it into that context. What, you know, what curing cancer would do, what curing heart disease would do. You get like maybe 10% in total or five, whatever it is exactly. Here you're talking about almost 30%. That's uh, that could be a game changer. Uh, just to give people a background of what a carbos is or a carbos, I'm not sure how to say it, but it's this uh, drug they give to a, a diabetics that blocks the uptake of glucose. Yes. And is that the mechanism by which it's extending aging? Do you think that it's good question decreasing it blood glucose? Yeah, good question. It doesn't exactly block the uptake of glucose. What it uh, what it does is it blocks the breakdown of starches to glucose in your bowel. So if you eat uh, six donuts for breakfast, uh, you, if you don't have a carbose, you get a huge glucose spike because your intestines break the starch down, turn it into glucose, you absorb the glucose. If you've had a carbose, that breakdown is much, much slower. So glucose does go up in your blood, but it goes up much more slowly at a, a, a more gentle pace. And it never reaches the, the huge peak that you would get after your fifth or sixth donut out here in the real world. So we think that that ability to block peak daily glucose is how a carbose works. And we think so in part because of the results we've just published on canagliflozin, uh, published last year. Canagliflozin also, which is also used in human diabetics, also reduces peak glucose, but it doesn't work in the gut. It works in the kidney. It allows people who've had their six donuts to um, lose a lot of the extra glucose into the urine. So you can see how it would protect a diabetic person for whom high glucose levels are a, a serious threat. Since canagliflozin works great, although in males only, and acarbose works great, although better in male, it works in both sexes, but it's better in males than it is in females. It's a reasonable guess that the thing they have in common, which is blocking peak glucose levels, might be um, the mechanism. So we don't know that. We haven't proven that, but it's a reasonable guess. And are these doses given in what maybe a diabetic would take, or are they given in much higher doses when you do these studies? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and I, I think it's tricky for non-specialists to say, here's the mouse dose. What is the equivalent human dose? It depends an awful lot on uh, speed of absorption, speed of ex excretion, and how they get sort of deposited into different tissues and then slowly released over time. The doses that are given to humans are selected in order to prevent surges in blood glucose. And the doses that we use in mice are selected in mice to prevent surges in blood glucose. So they're pharmacologically equivalent in that sense. In all the research that you've seen, let's say, or that you've done, the highest longevity that was ever achieved was this 29% from rapamycin from and drugs. Carbos? That's the highest amount from drugs. Okay. Um, and what about supplements? Oh, I'm sorry. By drugs, I meant drugs and supplements. Okay. <laughs> I, I was nitpicking there because... Calorie restriction diets can get you to about 40%, and a number of single gene mutants, it's arguable, but 35 or 40 or 45% is not an unreasonable expectation. But for things you put into the food or water, yeah, uh, the best I've ever seen uh, for regular old mice is uh, this 
29% figure. If you have particularly weird mice, like mice that have a, a deficit in a specific biochemical pathway and they live 20 days, you can make them live a lot more than 40 days by giving them the nutrient they can't make. But that's a, a special circumstance unrelated to aging. Interesting. So... And what about, uh, I mean, th there's a little bit of controversy on calorie restriction because there was that big NIH-funded study, I believe it was NIH-funded, that they did it on monkeys and they didn't find any uh, longevity benefits. Uh, no, is that, am, I, am I botching that? Yeah, I know what studies you mean, and it's a little more complicated and complicated in an interesting way. There were two such studies. One was done by the NIH Intramural Program, and one was done, I think, in uh, Wisconsin in the Midwest. So uh, they had very different protocols. In one case, if the mo monkey got sick, you were allowed to treat it because that's what they would do for a person. In the other if the monkey got sick, you were not allowed to treat it because that's what they would do for a mouse or a rat. And they were trying to replicate the mouse or rat studies. In one of them, about a third of the females got a disease, endometriosis, that can kill a monkey. A caloric restriction diet blocked endometriosis. In real life, colonies of monkeys out there in the wild in Africa or India where they live, they never get endometriosis. The females can breed. They're allowed to mate. They're not virgins and they don't get endometriosis in the artificial conditions of a lab research colony. They're virgins. They don't get to mate. And the endometriosis is, is really a problem. Also, the diets were radically different in their sugar content. One of them tasted terrific, and the other tasted like pet food, you know? <laughs> so uh, the one that tasted terrific and had a lot of sugar, they got a lot of the diseases that are sugar and glucose dependent in the other colony. Even though they were doing ca calorie restriction. Yeah, they got uh, either calorie restriction with a terrific tasting diet. These animals got only slightly fat or regular, as much as you want to eat diet. They got really fat. So the, the two studies were not run in the same way. And not too surprisingly, they came to fairly different conclusions. In both cases, calorie restriction animals lived a little longer, but whether it was because they were getting more diseases of aging or more diseases related to obesity or whether the, yes, I am allowed to treat it or no, I'm not allowed to treat it. It's sort of a muddle. My, my take-home message as a interested observer is that calorie restriction probably would work in monkeys. It works in almost anything that you test. It has nothing to do with humans because humans can't do calorie restriction. I mean, I weigh 180 pounds. If I was going to do calorie restriction, I would have to lose uh, 60 pounds and keep it off for my entire life. Almost no one can do that. I mean, there's one tenth of 1% of people who have exactly the obsessive body-centered personality that they can do it. And they're interesting people to study and they're interesting people to talk to. But as a practical matter for human clinical populations, people like you and me and my brothers and sisters and nieces and aunts and things like that, cal restriction is not a clinical argument. You, you, you can't uh, fly by waving your hands very, very hard. But as a research tool, it's terrific. What we really need to know for humans and monkeys and mice and rats is how it works. That is what things are modified by caloric restriction that, for instance, are also modified by rapamycin and modified by 17 alpha estradiol and modified by these anti-aging genes. This is the sort of obsession of my lab now. We've made a list of 13 things in mice that are modified by caloric restriction, but also by nine other, eight other kinds of slow aging mice. And this way we're sort of of the hundreds of things that caloric restriction does, we have found 13 so far <laughs> that are also changed by anti-aging genes and anti-aging drugs. Those we hope, we're arguing, you know, making a pitch here, those 13s are the way it works. And we want to know, for instance, what drugs or supplements can people take that turn those 13 things on? <laughs> that might be a good way of finding out what drugs or supplements are the ones that actually have some plausibility as anti-aging drugs in people. What do you think of glycine? That's another one you mentioned that you studied. What was the longevity impact there? And what's your overall impression of glycine? And how much were these mice taking exactly if you were to kind of do a rough equation to humans? Right. Joel Brind, our collaborator on that, had done a small experiment with a couple dozen rats. He gave them a diet very, very, very enriched in glycine, and they lived longer. It was statistically significant, but not a lot. 
and it was rats. So we did it in mice with a lot of mice. We used an enormous amount of glycine. 8% of the diet by weight was glycine, which is huge. How much glycine? Yeah, well, like what would that be in a human diet, for example? How many well, grams? Well, let's see. Um, 8% of the uh, diet if for every nasty. kilogram of food, you'd have to eat um, 80 grams of glycine, right? So it's a oh lot my of gosh. glycine. Right, that's the that's idea. That's a ton. Okay. So it's the... We've never used any drug at a higher concentration than glycine. We used that concentration (laughs) because that's what Joel had used on his rats. And we wanted to see if we could get it to work in mice. So in females, it had no effect. In males, it had a statistically significant effect. It was really small, 3 or 4% in terms of the median Mm. survival. But we believe it because it worked at all three sites. It worked in both sexes uh, at all three sites. So it's real. (laughs) But... It did not affect maximum longevity. That is, say, how long are the oldest 10% in each group? We, we didn't see a change in that. And, and the amount of change we saw, 4 or 5%, was so small that we haven't worked further on it. We have at least four drugs, six drugs now that work two, twofold to fivefold better than that. And so we are focusing our attention on drugs where the window of change is a lot bigger than glycine. What, uh, okay, so let's get to spermidine, what your opinion is on spermidine. I, I saw you talk about a little bit about it. Uh, so let's go a little more into that. What do you think uh, of that supplement in terms of anti-aging potential? Well, I have two things to say about it. One is that I don't know anything about it. <laughs> if there's good evidence, good data suggesting that spermidine slows aging, I would love to see some references and some data that I could evaluate. I don't know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, one of the people who thinks that spermidine is probably good for you and slows aging, asked the ITP, the, my group with Dave Harrison at the Jackson Lab and Randy Strong at Texas, please test spermidine. We said, hey, it looks great. Let's try it out. So we always do a pilot. We give the stuff, any drug, two mice for eight weeks, and then uh, we look at their blood and we look at their tissues to see if the drug is going up and the drug level is going up and it hadn't. And the guy said, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it takes six months. <laughs> it takes six months. So we said, okay, let's try it. So we gave them spermidine for six months at the concentration this um, enthusiast had recommended. And again, we did not see any change in the tissue. We looked at, I don't know, half a dozen tissues or plasma levels of spermidine. Uh, We sent him, he did all the assays for us. We sent him coded tissues. He didn't know which tissues Mm. were controls and which were treated, but he used his own methods. He looked at spermidine and he also looked at a metabolite that spermidine often gets uh, turned into spermine. Since we had no evidence whatsoever that it was increasing levels of spermidine or its metabolites in any tissue, even after six months, we declined to test it out. It, if you're taking a drug that the body really doesn't have any of, like ravamycin, it's easy to see that it goes up in, in tissues because it's, you're starting from zero baseline. But the body is filled with spermine and spermidine, and cells make it all the time in varying concentrations. And so what you're looking for is evidence that putting the stuff in the food increases the, uh, the levels over and above the endogenous levels that each of us is making all the time. That's a harder uh, you know, hurdle to jump over. And at least in our hands, trying as hard as we could, we didn't see any evidence that spermidine could jump over that barrier. Now, maybe another dose or another schedule or whatever would do better. Uh, or maybe it, it works because it goes to some part of the brain that we didn't look at. I mean, you could always make up stories, but I'd rather see data. And what about, okay, so moving on, what, what do you think about resveratrol? As you know, there's a lot of hype with resveratrol. And I guess on a similar note, terostilbene. I agree. This is the resveratrol is sort of the poster child for hype over data. We tested resveratrol in the ITP. We tested it at two different doses, uh, starting at two different ages. The at the time, one of the leading proponents was a uh, smart guy named David Sinclair, who's a faculty member at Harvard. We asked. He's David, still a proponent. He sure is. Uh, we said to David and to his senior colleague, Rafa de Cabo, what dose should we test? 
should we test the dose that was in your famous paper alleging that resveratrol was good for mice? And they said, no, 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 no. Use a much higher dose. Use this dose. So we took their advice. We tested the dose they told us to take, two different doses at two different ages, uh, and it had no effect on lifespan whatsoever. Now, in fact, oh, they also did that experiment. And although <laughs> they don't talk much about it, it also had no effect on lifespan in their mice either. What had What it had an effect on was mice that are on a 60% coconut oil diet. This is the paper that first made resveratrol famous. Coconut, that diet is poisonous for mice. It kills them quickly. It doesn't do so by accelerating aging. What it does is it makes their liver swell up with fat. The liver gets so huge that it compresses the chest cavity, crushing the lungs so they can't inhale. That's what the coconut oil, <laughs> they published that three years later in a separate paper. <laughs> that the cause of death in these mice was compression of the chest by an enormously swollen liver. If you believe their data, the, the one that made them famous, resveratrol given to these coconut oil mice uh, allowed them to live a little bit longer. That is, the median survival was increased slightly, significantly, but slightly. Now, that initial paper did not bother to mention that when you let them go past the median, the two curves come together and it had no significant effect on total lifespan. So the data suggests the mouse data conclusively show that resveratrol doesn't extend mouse lifespan on a normal mouse diet. Uh, even if you really want it to, because you've got a company you want to sell, uh, it still doesn't work. <laughs> I think you answered my next question. Why do you think he's hyping it so much? Um, oh, I have no... But David Sinclair, I mean, I have no uh, no insight into his motivations. I'm sure like most people, he has a mixture of, I'd like to do good science, I'd like to do good things for people, and I'd like to be successful academically and commercially. David is the only person who could answer this question in a satisfactory way uh, for you. Okay. I'm, I'm always a little distrustful of, um, not completely a distrustful, but a little distrustful of exciting scientific data submitted by laboratories where one of the, the principal investigators has a commercial stake. Early on, there were very few such laboratories. Nobody wanted to invest money in anti-aging pills. Now, I, I feel sort of isolated. Almost all of my friends who are respected, brilliant scientists have a company. I'm one of the very few people that doesn't have a company. So when I see a paper from company A saying, take my senolytic drug A, it's great for you. And then the people own company B say, no, 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 take my senolytic drug B. It's really, really good for you. I want to reserve judgment until I see some data reproduced by someone that doesn't own a company selling senolytic drugs. You're, you're my anti-aging longevity expert because uh, you don't have the financial interest. So I, I trust you the most. Good. What do you think about NMN or NR? nicotinamide mononucleotide or nicotinamide riboside. That's another one that I would say, or another two that are extremely hyped, famous, relatively famous scientists that uh, have financial commercial interests. What, what do you think? It's an area where a lot more attention and a lot more data are really needed, both mouse data and also human data. It, it, I think it's, it's really strongly established that as you get older, your body starts to get less good at, at metabolizing NAD, which is a sort of central compound around which all of these metabolites rotate, it's really plausible that there might be some health benefit from improving that, making for some cell types more of NAD or more reduced NAD or more NMN available. So the general notion is really good. The only data that the ITP has done, somebody said test NR, which is nicotinamide riboside. It's a great idea. We did test it. It had no effect on mouse lifespan, but it oh, could be that NMN might have worked or some other agent that interferes with the breakdown of nicotinamide compounds or a different dose might have worked. I think it would be a bad idea to give up, but I think it's you want to sort of limit your claims to things where the data are supportive. A lot of the things that you can buy online now, they're not allowed to say this will slow aging because they'd go to jail and the FDA would get unhappy. They can wink and nod. They can have a testimony from Bobby G in Toledo, Ohio said, I've never felt younger in my life. That sort of thing. Right. Well, what do you think about carnosine or beta alanine? Is that something I you know need? nothing about any of these things? Okay. Because these, I'm just listing things that I thought there's maybe some mouse study or, or, you know, I don't remember exactly, but 
these are kind of like the famous ones in the anti-aging circles. So I, I want to see like hype or, you One know, the or is there I, actually... I, I'm realizing here is that you and your buddies who are really into anti-aging supplements know a lot more than I do about these things because as far as I know, there's almost no data on them. I mean, no data right. from a careful scientific controlled study. But that's what I'm trying to separate. The, the, the stuff that's good from the stuff that there's no data on uh, in terms of longevity. What about Fisodin? Also no data? The ITPS study, this, we have concluded our study. It's not uh, published yet. Uh, I, it, we have completed the data, so I am allowed by our policy to tell you what the answer is. The answer is it had no effect whatsoever on mouse lifespan. <laughs> uh, Jim Kirkland at the Mayo uh, Clinic, a terrific scientist, said, we think Fisodin is going to work. Please test it. And he, he told us, use this dose and try it twice. In one case, give it for the entire life of the mouse, starting from 20 months of age. In the other, start at 20 months of age, give them three days of it, then 11-day vacation, three days of it, then 11-day vacation. We, we tested it using both of these schedules at the dose Jim told us to use from the supplier Jim told us to use. It had no effect. It didn't hurt them, but it didn't help them at all. And then we said, well, you know, Jim, you think this is deleting so-called senescent cells. Tell you what, we'll give you tissues from these mice. We'll code them so you won't know which ones are which. You tell us how many senescent cells there are, and then we'll tell you if the Fisetin modified senescent cells. He says, yep, great idea. So he and uh, his colleague, uh, Tamara Chikonia, did uh, seven or eight different tests for senescent cells in the tissues we sent them. There was no deletion of senescent cells in the Fisetin-treated mice. So the dose that our colleague, our expert colleague, told us to use, A, did not delete senescent cells, and not too surprisingly, it didn't have any effect on lifespan. Interesting. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, one of the takeaways from this podcast and interview is that some of the things that I was kind of taking for anti-aging purposes, I think I might stop, including resveratrol, fisodin, maybe terastilbene. I kind of take them in, in smaller doses. Like, let's say if something's normally 100 milligrams of fisodin, I'll just take it like in 10 milligrams or something like that. Just like, why not? It's, you know, it's what you get in like strawberries or something. I, I, I'm the last person in the world who would want to stop you from taking uh, some of these <laughs> things or encourage you to take these things. I don't know anything about right. you or your medical condition or your psychological needs for these things. But the one thing that uh, it's worth pointing out, I've been stating all along, because something works in mice doesn't mean that it will work in humans, but the inverse is true also. There may well be compounds that are ineffective in mice, but actually have benefits in people. Until there's some data, decisions to take or not to take these are based largely on one's own personality quirks. So the only kind of over-the-counter thing that I've heard you speak about that has like a very small effect is glycine. Is there anything else that we missed you could buy on like Amazon or something? Like rapamycin or acarbose, you're not going to get on Amazon, right? Those are drugs. Here's how I think of it. Some of these drugs, uh, metformin is the famous, most famous of these, are very often safe. I mean, if you take a person who's got diabetes or as in my case, pre-diabetic, you put them on metformin, about 10% of the time they have GI symptoms, constipation or diarrhea, and it's unpleasant, so they go off. But 90% of the time, there's no, no serious side effects for years and years and years. If you go to your doctor and you say, you know, uh, I have a, a condition like diabetes or pre-diabetes, and I've heard that uh, metformin is going to be good for me, I'd like to, like to take that. Often a doctor will say yes, it's a prescription drug, so you either have to have a doctor who agrees with you or be willing to go outside the American medical system, which people now know how to do if they want. There are human data suggesting that metformin uh, may well be beneficial. They don't come from a long-term clinical trial, which is the best data. They come from epidemiology. But uh, there's, there's a study of thousands and thousands of, of diabetics who took metformin. And to everyone's surprise, not only did it work in diabetes, that wasn't a surprise, their risk of death was lower than normal people. So that's a, it doesn't prove, but it's a strong hint that metformin might be good for normal people. There's a consortium of 11 American universities that wants to test that. They are looking for money that will allow them to take 3,000 healthy older people, give them, half of them will get metformin, half of them will get a placebo, and then they'll come back five and 10 years later and see who got what disease. I think that's a, it's a, an expensive idea. But that would be great. Idea, yeah. So but is, is there any kind of 
That's still a drug, though. Is there any kind of natural substance besides glycine, which had a small effect, that your research or you've seen research that showed had a longevity effect in mice? Oh, no, uh, not, not from <laughs> this is a direct answer to okay. your question. Of course, there are things that will not surprise anybody, because uh, doctors have been saying this for decades now, that will keep you healthier longer. Fewer French fries, more broccoli, more fiber, all of that. All that's well known. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. It actually does work, however. Okay. You that, that's it great. So, or you buy it at the grocery store. <laughs> right. That's great. Uh, okay, so we're that's pretty much the end of the interview, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on. You definitely uh, enlightened me on some things. I'm probably going to be excluding some supplements from my regimen <laughs> after this. Appreciate all your insights. Is there any uh, last things you want to say? Where can people find you? Oh, uh, I'm at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. There's a website that's easy to find if you search for my name and the word aging. And it tells people who are interested what we do and uh, gives a list of some publications and some references to the ITP and to the Glenn Foundation for Medical Research, which also sponsors our studies. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and imparting your knowledge and wisdom. And uh, Thank have you for the invitation. Day. It's been a pleasure. Hope you enjoyed this. Please subscribe. Please like. Please review. Whatever it is. YouTube, you like. iTunes, review it. And this way, I will do more of it if I see that people are really liking this stuff.